Sunday is the best day of the week. Look forward to it every week. Well, I want to begin by expressing my appreciation that you've invited me to come and be with you this week to talk about the important subject of evangelism. So let me just begin this, this week by saying I'm not an expert. I'm not a specialist. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, and I feebly try to do what God tells us to do to share the faith, to help him to save the lost. And I hope that I encourage you this week to do the same or, or to improve the abilities and the things that you are doing in, in your work of helping to save the lost. So I just want you to know I don't know that there are or that there should be experts in evangelism. We should all be evangelists. And so let's, uh, let's look at God's word this week together. Let's motivate one another. Doesn't that, isn't that what it says in Hebrews chapter 10? We're to come together and to stir one another to love and to good works. And so let's stir each other up this week. Let's look into God's word and see what he tells us. Do you have a mic on? Mm -hmm. It's over. Okay. Let's look into God's word and see what he tells us about this important work in the green light zone, this important work of evangelism. There was a third century man who was anticipating his death. And as he was anticipating his death, he penned these words. It's a bad world. An incredibly bad world. But I discovered in the midst of it, quiet, holy people who have learned a great secret. They found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. Brother, our joy in what we have found is crucial to our own happiness. Amen? It's crucial to our faithfulness. It's crucial to our influence upon others and our success in leading them to Christ. In fact, another writer put it this way. He said the best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their certainty, their, their completeness, their, their joy. But he continued and said the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians. When they are somber and joyless, when they are self-righteous and smug and complacent consecrations, when they are narrow and repressive, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. So over and over, the Bible tells us that we are to be happy and that we are to rejoice in the Lord. Amen? And so Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 3, it tells us that we are to rejoice. And you remember the setting, Paul is in prison. And even in the midst of prison, he is telling his fellow Christians that they are indeed to rejoice. In Philippians chapter 3, and this week I'll be reading from the New King James Version. But in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, there we read simply, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, I don't feel like I have to explain this, but let me take just a moment. This is not a suggestion. This is not a, if you feel good rejoicing, this is a commandment, is it not? He is commanding us to rejoice in the Lord. And so we have that obligation, if you will. It's so you think about joy as being an obligation. It's a commandment, brethren. He tells us that we are to rejoice in the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, he goes on again to say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Again, that is another direct command from the Lord. That we are to rejoice. And then the text for our study together is simply two words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. There he says, rejoice always. Once again, a command. And it's not left open to rejoice when you feel good. Rejoice when something good happens to you. It says to rejoice always. And so we need to understand what he means by this word rejoice. What we need to realize is that as he commands us to rejoice, 
We're not talking about some fake happiness. We're not talking about a facade that we're putting off. And inside, we're, we're, our hearts are broken and crushed. Our lives are filled with, with burdens and, and difficulties. But we put on our fake face and we smile. No, he's telling us that we are to rejoice always. In the midst of that bad health, in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those difficulties, we are still to rejoice. And here's what our lesson is about this morning. I think that sometimes the storms of life get us down. Sometimes all the distractions and the burdens that we have in our life, they take away our joy. So what I want to simply do in this <clears throat> simple lesson this morning is to remind us of the reasons we have to rejoice. No matter what you're going through in your life, you can obey this command. No matter what's happening in, in your heart and, 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 and the difficulties you might be facing, we can obey this command to rejoice. So what is this word that he uses? What does it mean? <clears throat> the word in the Greek language just simply means to be cheerful, to be full of cheer. That is calmly happy or well off. So he's not talking here about we need to be giddy and bouncing off the walls. and We need to be raising our hands and shouting to the Lord. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about inside we need to be calmly happy. I know this is going on. I know this is happening in my life and I'm a Christian. And there are some great benefits to being a Christian that no matter what happens to me, I have a joy that the Lord has given me. And so it means to be calmly happy, to be well off. So let's spend the rest of our time this morning talking about some of those things that we have, that we have as Christians that ought to keep us Filled with happiness, filled with joy, with contentment. I just want to remind us, brother, for those of us who are Christians, there ought to be great joy and forgiveness. Amen? And so he tells us in Acts chapter 8, we see some examples of, of this joy that people experienced when their sins were forgiven. In Acts chapter 8, remember Stephen is stoned. <clears throat> There's a persecution that arises against the church. Philip goes down to Samaria, and he's preaching the gospel to them. We pick up in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, don't let your mind, let's not let our minds go to, they were being healed. There were miracles being done. And surely there would have been joy. It's not only from the miracles that he was doing, but from the teaching. They were hearing the gospel. And when you go down just a few more verses, their sins were being washed away. And so there was joy for all that was going on while Philip was among them. And then also, and dropping down further, in chapter 8 to verse 36. And you remember how <clears throat> that the Ethiopian eunuch had been in Jerusalem worshiping. And he's on his way back home and he's riding in his chariot. And the Lord tells Philip to go join himself in the chariot. And he gets up in the chariot and he's invited in. And he begins with the scripture from Isaiah. And he preaches Jesus Christ to this man. Verse 35. And then in verse 36. It says, now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Then verse 39, and when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. I know, brethren, that you know this passage. I'm not going to probably share with you any passage that has slipped your memory this week. But we need reminders, though. We need reminders that there is cause for us to rejoice. Let's look at one more. In Acts chapter 16, verses 32 through 33. Paul and Silas have been in prison just simply because they're preaching the gospel. Acts 16 and verses 32 through 34. The 
the, the, the jailer comes in and he realizes that God is in the midst of all of this. He asks them what he needs to do to be saved. He tells them that they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they would be saved. Then they, he had his household. And then in verse 32 it says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. <clears throat> and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, and he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Over and over, we're seeing examples. These people were filled with joy. They were rejoicing. And why were they rejoicing? Because their sins had been washed away. They had been forgiven. Brother, I remember the day I was baptized in I was 20 years old, and if you're looking there, sitting, thinking, hmm, I wonder how long ago that was. <laughs> it was 40 years ago, and I will never forget that day. I've been living in the world. We moved from the woods of Alabama to the suburbs of Chicago when I was a little boy. My dad was a drinker. In many ways, he was a very good and honest man, but he was a drinker. I grew up in a house where we had barbecues and all the men were drinking their beer and, and drinking whiskey. I grew up in that environment. So by the time I was 14, I was doing something besides beer to get high. Every day before school, we would get together. Every day after school, we would get together. By the time I was 19 years old, I was playing in a band in the bars of the suburbs of Chicago as lead singer for a southern rock band. And if we weren't playing in a bar, we were practicing, and you can imagine the things that were going on in those practices. I had a 72 charger with an RT package. I was a mechanic, my dad was a mechanic. I had a 750 Suzuki two cycle. 752 cycle, if you know what that's about. Liquid cooled motorcycle. I had an RM125 Suzuki dirt bike. And all my friends were thinking, man, he's got it made. He's a singer and a band. He's got an RT charger. He's got two great bikes. It must be nice. I was laying on my bed at night, praying for God to take my life and change it. And then I met Penny. We just came back from Fiji. We started work down there several years ago, and so we just got back at the end of February for a trip down there. And, and as I was talking to the people, it, it's made up of, of Melanesians, meaning that their, their roots are from Africa, and many of the other people living there are Indian, and so everybody's dark skinned. And I said, I'm so happy that Penny, my wife, is with me. You can probably figure out who she is. <laughs> so today I'd have to have her stand up, maybe. <laughs> but at any rate, me and Penny, uh, we started dating. Penny and I started dating. And after a few months, we're driving down the road one day. At that time, I had a 72 Le Mans Sport. Hoods, coops, the whole deal. We're driving down the road, and I look over at her. We've gotten serious in our dating. We were moving toward toward being engaged. And I looked over at her and I said, would you like to go to church with me Sunday? And she looks at me like, where did that come from? <laughs> Make a long story short, we started attending some congregations searching for the truth. And we found it. And I went forward one Sunday morning to be baptized, to have my sins forgiven. And I got up off of that front pew and I walked away without being baptized. It's not that I didn't believe it. It's not that I didn't want to do it. I was scared to death. Because I understood the commitment that I was about to make. And Penny and I had had the conversation. We're either going to do this the right way or we're not going to do it at all. Two weeks later, I went forward again. And I was baptized into Christ. After all the hugs, after all the joy, we go out to the parking lot, we get in the car, and I'm driving down the road, and we're not talking. 
And I am now thinking, I have been afraid for him. Nobody had to convince me before, if you die, you're going to hell. If they had asked me, I said, I'm going to hell. I knew where I was headed. And now, instead of thinking, if the Lord comes, I'm in trouble. Now we're riding down the road and I'm thinking, what will it be like when Jesus comes back? What will it be like when we see him in the sky with all those angels and all? And I was filled with joy. Now I took a long way around asking you, do you remember that day? Do you remember the day you were baptized into Christ? Do you remember that that feeling of forgiveness, knowing that all your sins have been removed from you and now you have a brand new beginning with Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I remember that feeling. And I understand what the scriptures say, that they went on their way rejoicing. Brethren, we are Christians. Our sins have been washed away and let us never forget it. Let us never forget it. <clears throat> what the Lord has done for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is great cause for rejoicing. When we are baptized into Christ, <clears throat> when we are baptized into Christ, it is then that we pass from death, from condemnation into life. In John chapter 4, 5, John chapter 5, in verse 24, Jesus says, it says, and when the people therefore saw that, I mean John chapter 6, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Now that's the New King James Version. When it says that he shall not come into judgment, it doesn't mean that he's going to bypass the judgment day. That's not what it's saying. When it says he shall not come into judgment, it means judgment as in a condemning judgment upon us. And we will not come under condemnation if we are Christians. We have passed from condemnation into life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, as Paul is speaking about the struggle with sin and how we want to do what is right, but we often end up doing what is wrong. And, and so it burdens our heart down and we feel remorse. I hope we do. We feel remorse for the sins that we're creating. And he says at the end of the chapter, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he doesn't mean death that we're mortal and we're going to end up in a grave someday. He means this body with its, its desires and we fulfill them in sinful ways. It brings death upon us. Separation from God. That's the death he's talking about. Who will deliver me? Help me. Who will help me from this body of sin, this body of death, fulfilling those desires in simple ways? He says, praise be to God. It's Jesus Christ. And then he says in chapter 8 and verse 1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation. If we're washed in the blood of Jesus, we have passed from condemnation into life. And in His blood, we have forgiveness. And that leads us to our next point. I remember when I became a Christian. There were two or three weeks. I don't know how long it went, but it was a short period of time. There were two or three weeks that I was so thrilled and so happy. Jesus comes back. I'm going to heaven. And then I don't know what it was, but I committed some sin. And I don't know what it was, but I committed some other sin. And I committed some other sin, and now I'm beginning to doubt. Am I going to go to heaven if Jesus comes back? And after a while... I asked, I mean, I'm a new Christian. I'm a babe. I didn't grow up in the church. The Bible's new to me. And I asked the preacher, I said, can we know whether or not we're going to go to heaven? He said, well, sure we can know. I said, oh, good. I'm getting ready. I'm going to hear what I need to hear. He said, Paul knew he was going to heaven, so we can know we're going to heaven. I, said, I know Paul was going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And so, one day I'm reading my Bible and I ran across 1 John chapter 1. Turn with me there. We're going to bypass the other verses for the sake of time. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 
First John chapter 1 and verse 5, we're going to begin. He says, This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God's pure. God is holy and there's no sin. There's no, there's no uh, 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 evil in him at all. And he says, If we say that we're in fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we keep on sinning. He says, We lie and do not practice the truth. And then he says in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it was like a burden was lifted off my shoulders. I was already worried. I'm doing things I shouldn't do. I don't, I don't remember what they were, but I was not going back to beer and not going back to drugs and all that stuff. But you know, and I know, we got to be holy as God is holy. So I don't remember what those sins were, but I was worried. And then when I read this, and I understood walking in the light, I, I understood what that meant. <coughs> we're trying our best to be holy. We're trying our best to be like God. If I'm trying my best, I'm trying to be the best Christian that I can be, and I still commit a sin, if I will confess that sin, if I will return in repentance and ask God to forgive me, he says he will be faithful and just to forgive me of all unrighteousness. Amen? And so I knew this is how I can know if I'm going to heaven. Not by my goodness. Yeah, we got to try the very hardest that we can. But through that forgiveness that God keeps on giving us. Hebrews chapter 7, Jesus is our intercessor who's able to save us to the uttermost. Hebrews chapter 9, he has appeared in the presence of God for us. And Frank, what a great book that you just finished. God, Jesus Christ, is our mediator in the very presence of God. And so, brethren... Let's not forget, we may be going through difficulties, we may be going through trials in our lives, but we have cause for rejoicing because we are Christians and our sins are forgiven. Amen. Now, let's notice another point. We have cause to rejoice because we are now reconciled to God. We are in fellowship with God. Notice with me in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 in verses 19 through 23. Colossians 1 verse 19 begins. There we read, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, yet now he has reconciled. We could read on, but what he's saying there is you and I, brethren, who are Christian, he says that we were enemies of God because of our sins. But now he's reconciled us. And so we are now no longer separated from God. We are no longer at en enmity with God, but now we are in fellowship with him. I don't know if you're like me. But there are some of these concepts that are so, so, so simply laid out in scriptures but are too profound for me to get my mind around. The supreme being of the universe, God, our creator, and I'm in fellowship with him? I may not be able to comprehend it, but I believe it. And so we have reason to rejoice. We are in fellowship with our God. This is what he calls us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, verse 9, he tells us that this is what the gospel is about. To call us back into fellowship with God. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And in another passage, in 1 John chapter 1, I should have had you hold your finger there. I apologize that I didn't. But let's go back to 1 John chapter 1. And, and I'll not lay down the background for the book. You probably are familiar with that in the Gnostic teaching. But in verse 1, he says, That which was for, from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. 
The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. God wants us to know that we're in fellowship with him. He wants us to know that we're in fellowship with Christ. So that we will have joy in our hearts. So that we will have this contentment and this happiness inside. He's writing to these Christians who are being told by the Gnostics, you're not in fellowship with God. You've got to have a higher level of, of spiritual understanding. And so he's writing, no, we've seen the Lord. We touched him. We handled him. We heard him. And I want you to know you're in fellowship with God. And I want you to know this so that your joy may be full. We have joy because we are in fellowship with God. Another reason for our joy is that we have fellowship with Christians. Isn't it sad when some Christians really don't care about being with other Christians? We have to prod them, we have to call them, we have to try our hardest to bring them to maturity so that they want to be with the assembly, they will want to be with other Christians. How sad indeed. This is a cause for rejoicing. We have one another. We are the family of God. We've all been washed of our sins. We are in fellowship with God, and we are in fellowship with one another. You remember Acts 2.47. It says, and the Lord added to the church, that is in the New King James Version, the Lord added to the number daily those who are being saved. So when we are baptized into Christ, our sins are forgiven. God adds us to his group of saved people. And there ought to be great rejoicing in that. That we belong to our God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, he says that by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. And so this ought to be meaningful to us. Let's go over to Philippians and we'll just read this one passage out of that cluster. But in Philippians chapter 1, notice with me verses 3 through 11. And I'll not go back and point out every single one. What I want you to notice as we're reading, he speaks of his affection for these brothers. He speaks of his love. He speaks of his longing to be with them. Notice first. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of this grace. For God is my witness how I greatly long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. Till the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. If we're not loving one another, brother, we need to get to it. This ought to be the most important and meaningful thing in our lives. That we get to come together. That we are in the same family and there's a bond that ties us together. Our children all lived within a couple of hours of us until recently. We're in Springfield, Illinois, just right in the center of Illinois. Our youngest son was working with us uh, there. He and his wife were with us. Our daughter lived an hour north and now she and her husband moved down to uh, Temple Terrace. He's working for Florida College. And our oldest son moved from St. Louis down to Athens, Alabama. We want to be with our children. We want to be with our grandchildren. And when that phone rings, and I see that it's one of my children, the mood changes. <laughs> and we're planning a vacation together this summer going to be in June. We are already planning. We are already excited. Young people, let me say this to you. Paul Harvey, who you don't know, 
Paul Harvey had an episode one time and he said that it took him years to realize this. When you live away from your parents and you're going to come back home on vacation and visit them, don't sneak in and surprise them. He says half of the joy of being a parent waiting for their children to come is the anticipation a week, two weeks, a month earlier that you know they're coming and it's just this happiness and this joy that's building the whole time. You have experienced that, any of you? Amen. Amen. And so we are God's family. It ought to make our heart feel good to know that we're coming together on Sunday to worship. It ought to make our hearts feel good that we're going to get together on whatever night it is for a singing and, and, and a prayer service, if you will. We're going to get together at this time. We're going to go together to, with one another to this gospel meeting. It ought to fill our hearts with joy because we are family. We are blood family. Blood of Jesus Christ. And so there is great joy, my brother. There is great joy in fellowship with one another. And so you see this throughout the scriptures. And remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, that they gathered daily in the temple. I don't think that was binding upon them. I think this was their choice. They gathered daily in the temple and they broke bread from house to house, eating their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Brethren, there is great joy in being in the family of God. And then our final point this morning is that there is joy in knowing that we're going to have it. Notice with me, over in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He says, and he's speaking about the resurrection, he's talking about our physical bodies being raised up and changed to be like Jesus' glorious body. But he says in there that our citizenship is in heaven. Have you ever lived outside of this country? Penny and I lived over two years in Fiji, and we were foreigners. And our children lived here. The culture that we're familiar with was here. And we were 7,000 miles away. We lived about a quarter of a mile off of the runway for the airport. No, no air conditioning in Fiji. So the windows were open and you had a fan to pull that nice, cool 95 degree air in. <laughs> and we'd have Bible studies in our homes a lot of times. And we're a quarter mile from the runway. And so this airplane would take off. <clears throat> That's what we'd have to do. You just have to stop talking because you can't hear one another. And you may think, well, why in the world? Penny and I look at each other and smile. Every time we heard that jet roaring, we would look at each other and smile. Because we knew someday it was going to take. It's not that we didn't want to be there. And brethren, it's not that we don't want to be here on earth. There's a lot of work that we need to be doing, isn't there? But more than that, we want to go home, don't we? Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are eagerly waiting for that Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12. Matthew 5 and verse 12. In what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He says there. Rejoice and be exceedingly, exceedingly glad when they persecute you. For great is your reward in heaven. Do we believe it, brethren? Do we believe that great is our reward in heaven? Let me ask you a question. And I'm guilty. The thumb's pointing right at, right at me. How often do you stop and look up to the skies and think Jesus could come today? I want the Lord to come. I want him to I can only think of one good reason why I don't want the Lord to come right now. What is it? Somebody? Because there are people that are lost. And we need to be helping them to be saved. 
Other than that, Lord Jesus, come. Come right now. Because great is our reward in heaven. And then finally, in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, the, the disciples come back and they're sharing with Jesus their excitement over what they have done because they have miraculous abilities that have been stowed upon them by him. And he says to them in verse 20, he says, now let's back up to verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Brethren, are we rejoicing that our names are written in heaven? You don't need me to tell you this. You've already figured it out. Bear with me for a moment. The purpose for this discussion today, the purpose for this lesson, is to remind us who we are. To remind us of what we have. And to help motivate us that no matter what we're going through, do not let the devil steal your joy from you. And if we have that joy like we read about in the scriptures, aren't we going to want to share it with others? Aren't we want, going to want them to know what we know? That when Penny and I were baptized and our sins were forgiven, I wanted everybody to experience what I experienced. I wanted everybody to know what I had. So, brother, let's renew that joy in our hearts. Is there any way we can help you today? Have you been overtaken by the cares and, and the trouble and the difficulty of this life? Has the devil robbed you of your joy that God wants you to have? It may be that you need the prayers and the encouragement of this congregation. Maybe you're struggling, you're trying to overcome a sin, some, something that you're, you're dealing with that has you feeling guilty and separated from God. Or maybe you're not a Christian and you want your sins forgiven today. If there's any way we can help you, please come. While we stand, while we stand.